planning a trip to Mesa Verde National Park with your kids and maybe even your RV, then you're definitely gonna wanna stay tuned to this video. We're gonna go through the logistics of getting to Mesa Verde, some of the things around the area. Then we're gonna jump into a bunch of video from our trip and the last time that we went, showing you various videos on the different tours and places that you can see. And then lastly, we're going to end by showing you some of the different camping options and where we ended up staying in our 37-foot Jayco Seneca. So thanks for tagging along and let's get started. I like to always start by doing a little bit of logistics. So this is the state of Colorado. You can see Denver is right here. If you're flying in to Colorado to go see Mesa Verde or you're flying in and then renting an RV, Denver is probably your base that you're going to go to. There's two main highways in Colorado. You have I-25 going north to south and you have I-70 going east to west. And so you're going to need to take one of those routes to work your way into the southwest corner, which is where Mesa Verde is located down here. Um, you can take 70 out to Grand Junction. Let me zoom in here. If you're going to do that, I highly recommend checking out Colorado National Monument before working your way down into Montrose um, and then further heading down into the southwest. If you're going to do the route and come down I-25 through Colorado Springs Pueblo, and then you get here to Walsenburg and you can pick up Highway 160, and this will take you all the way out over to Durango and Mesa Verde. You've got some mountain passes on here. You've got mountain passes on all of those directions, so you're not getting away from mountain passes. Um, it's Colorado and it's the Rockies, so you're gonna have that to deal with. I think the scariest thing that you could deal with that I highly recommend not dealing with is this stretch from Uray to Durango. This is called Highway 550. If you're in a car, it's fine, no big problem. If you're in a 40 foot RV and you're towing a Jeep and you're 65 feet in total length, I, I just, I wouldn't even do it. And if you're renting an RV where you're maybe not as comfortable and you're not as used to it, I wouldn't do it. This is a super dangerous road. It's known as the Million Dollar Highway. Um, I think because it cost a million dollars when they had to put it in a hundred years ago, many people have died on this road. You can see here, Red Mountain Pass goes up to 11,000 feet in elevation. This is no joke. The biggest part is that there are no um, side rails and there's no uh, turn off on the side. So pretty much you have the white line and then it drops off onto the mountain and there's nothing. I'll show you a little bit of video of that. So here you can see there's absolutely no shoulder. That's the word I was looking for, shoulder. There's no shoulder. It's just a complete drop off. And if it was just you alone on the road, yeah, maybe you could deal with that. It wouldn't be such a big deal. You really have to focus on not losing your trailer or your tow behind or anything else. But it's not just you. There's cars on the other direction. There's bicyclists up here and then they're totally in the road and you cannot get around them. And it's just, it's a miserable, stressful drive and it takes away from the enjoyment. So we camp somewhere outside of it and and then we drive our Jeep around to enjoy this highway. So you can see it's really not for the faint of heart. When we actually do this route, we come down through Uray and then we pretty much head in this way and we come over here. We've stayed kind of outside this area so we can visit Telluride, which I personally think is the best mountain town in Colorado. So I highly recommend doing this just if you're going to see Telluride. Um, and then you can come down through kind of Dolores and stuff. We ended up staying in Cortez and at the end of the video, I'll show you more about camping options. But the reason we stayed here is because you have Mesa Verde National Park right here. And then you also have access to Canyon of the Ancients in this area and Hove and Weep, which are both really great spots to check out. So let's dig into that map on Mesa Verde. So this is the park map for Mesa Verde. You can see Highway 160, like I mentioned, which will take you out to Durango to the east over here, or if you kept taking it to the west, you would get to Cortez. And so it's about 20 minutes or so from Cortez, and I think it's closer about 30, 35, 40 minutes over to Durango. And those are your two biggest towns, really in terms of staying if you wanna have hookups. But we'll talk more about staying after a bit. When you first come in, I highly recommend stopping here at the Visitor and Research Center. This is really an incredible research center, visitor center, and I'll show you video of that when we load into the, go into the videos. Um, but they have a ton of educational information. You can get your park maps there. You can buy your tour tickets there. It used to be, when we went, this video is all going to be from September of 2019. And when we went, the tickets were first come, first serve. So you would have to show up, come to the visitor center, and buy tickets for you know the next day or the next few days whenever you could get them 
And if you drove all the way down here and they didn't have any tour tickets, you were out of luck. I've heard since then that they moved to a reservation system, which is really nice because you don't wanna go from this far from another state or something and not be able to get your tour ticket. So they did move to online tour tickets. Now, of course, all the tours have been canceled because of COVID and they haven't resumed those yet, as far as I know. So I don't know when that's going to open up, but they should be reservable once you can do it. Once you have your tour tickets, then you're good to kind of plan your day and see what you're going to do for the day. Usually they only let you do no more than two tours and we did Balcony House and Cliff Palace on the same day and so I'll show you videos of those and I highly recommend both of those especially if you have kids not Balcony House if you have little kids but we'll talk more about that once you come in there's a campground here that does not have hookups um, but it is an option and then you pretty much don't want to be driving your RV in any further than this we've got a tunnel here you could do some of this this isn't like high mountain passes or anything it is a little squiggly as you can see it's not terribly horrible but at this point in time you can go one of two ways you can either head out to the Chapin Mesa which is where most people are going or you can go to the weather rail Mesa I've been to Mesa Verde many times in my life I'm a Colorado native and I have never been out to this stretch so it's not as common and if you don't want a lot of people that's probably the place where you actually want to head this road is not open in the winter time, so it has limited time when it's open in pretty much the summer. But you can take this out, and when you head out this way, you have long houses out here, and there's tours available for long house. This is a longer tour. It's about, I think it's two hours, and most of the others are an hour in length. So it may not be the best one if you have kids with you that might get bored or might need to use a bathroom or something like that. So this generally is probably going to have more adults because it's a longer tour. There's also some spots where you can just kind of walk in and do your own self-guided tours and see some things. So this is supposed to be a really cool loop. I've never done it though. So let's head back to Farview area. I've stayed in this lodge before when I was a kid and it's really neat because you're in this lodge and you have this big open view of the Mesa. So beautiful spot to see. You could even just stop here and have a snack if you want. Um, but you work your way down from the entrance of the park all the way down here to the area where um, Cliff Palace and stuff is at is a 21 mile stretch. And so they tell you to make sure when you have your tour that you are entering the park at least an hour before your tour meeting time is at. So you're not going to be able to drive this all the way down and get here to where the Cliff Palace and Balcony House and stuff is at. Because remember the speed limit on here is probably like 20 or 25 miles per hour. So it's really slow, you're in the National Park. When you get into this area, you can come down and Cliff Palace has a good deal of parking. I don't remember that it has specific RV parking, so I'm sorry, we did not have our RV when we did this. Um, there were some spots that were pull through, so maybe you could pull through and take up two spots if you had an RV. Um, so you could park there and there's an overlook where you can slightly walk down and then you can kind of see the Cliff Palace. You're not getting a super close up view if all you do is park at the parking lot and walk down and see it, but it's better than nothing. So you can at least see it. I recommend getting a tour for it though, because the tour is spectacular. I'll show you the whole tour. You'll see why you want to get the tour. The other thing is Balcony House is my favorite tour. Now it's not for little kids. It's not for people who have issues with heights or tight spaces because it has uh, plenty of both of those things. And I'll show you the whole tour for the balcony house too, because we have that on video. Um, but it is really exciting. So I highly recommend balcony house if you have older kids or you're adventurers or you're just adults and you want to check that out. We actually were able to do our balcony house tour and then we did an hour break between the two tours, made our way over and then parked at Cliff Palace and did the tour over here. So we were able to do them back to back at the same time in the loop. Um, and then come back up and this archaeological museum is really cool. There's a lot of information, great stuff if you're wanting to educate your kids about the area and the things here and I'll show you video for that as well. So let's get started with the actual video. These are some images from the Park Visitor Center, which is actually just outside of the entrance. So you can come here, learn about the park, get your tour tickets. There's even a spot where they have a cutout of the Balcony House tour stone dwelling and you can see whether or not you fit in it to decide if you want to take that tour. 
So for all the tours you meet with the ranger outside by the parking lot, be sure that you've gone to the bathroom ahead of time because it's not like there's going to be a spot for your kids to walk back on their own or anything. Um, this is only a quarter mile tour, so it doesn't seem like it's that long, but it's pretty intense when it comes to the stairs and the ladders and the tight spaces and all of that good stuff. So you do have to be with the ranger. You can see he's opening the gate for us and guiding us on the tour together. There is a 32 foot ladder that we're going to be climbing in a second. And after walking in the hot sun for a bit, then we're finally to a point where we can stop and the ranger will do some discussion while we're in a cool spot. This is what I wanted you guys to look at over here. It's the spring over here. And the cooking water. Yeah, the cooking Okay. So you're probably wondering, well, why are there springs here? Well, in the early history of the earth, this part of Colorado was actually under the water. There was a shallow sea here. It was called the Great Western Indian Sea. I love the ranger tours because they have such a great perspective and so much information. This is the 32 foot ladder then that you have to climb. This actually wasn't too horrible. I didn't think it was that bad. It was really hot though. I wish I had had gloves because the wood was so hot to touch. You didn't even want to touch it. And the girls were saying, I don't want to touch it, but you have no choice. Once you are to this point, you have to keep going. And actually at one point, Elsa was on the ladder with Jeremy and he turned to her, or she turned to him and said, Daddy, I can't go any further. And he said, honey, you have to keep going. Um, so, you know, if you have little kids, if you have anybody afraid of heights, I wouldn't recommend this tour. But if you're okay with that stuff, it's pretty cool and it's a pretty neat experience for your kids. Uh, there we go. There we go. Reaching and stepping like when your kids at the playground. There we go. And we're on to another one of those tight spaces, but it's just fun. It just keeps going on. It's like the never ending ladders and tight spaces to go through. So the kids are having a blast with this. And as you can see here, even after that first ladder in that tight space, you actually go to another area where there's more dwellings and you get to hear more of the details about these areas and how they lived in certain spots and where they would probably have fires and religious ceremonies and all sorts of cool stuff like that. So really exciting to be this close and personal to the dwellings. And that's something that you really only get to do if you're on a tour. Touch the bars because it's hot. Hold on to that. Exiting out of this dwelling space was um, a little bit of a challenge, too. So you have this dark hole that you just have to trust that there's going to be an end on the other side of that. You can tell the girls are debating if they really want to go through it but you walk through and it's darkness kind of behind there but it's really cool you can tell that there's light on the other side and you just need to keep continuing through and eventually you can get through and of course like i mentioned you might want to check out at the visitor center what the spacing is like for these tight spaces this one wasn't as bad the earlier one is where jeremy had some trouble getting his shoulders through and he had to kind of turn sideways in order to fit his shoulders through it's more an issue with shoulders if you're a broad-shouldered man um, on trying to be able to fit through here. And of course, he had some height issues too at 6'2". Overall, you do move through this tour kind of quickly. It's not like you have a lot of breaking points where you're stopping and looking around, but there ends up being some break points just because you're waiting for other people to go up ladders or go through spaces. And so you end up having some time to 
take some photos and uh, take in the surroundings and just imagine what it would be like actually living here. Oh, I actually remember now that this was the tightest space, as you'll see. Yeah, use those chains, pull yourself as you're climbing. That works a lot easier that way. The last bit of this tour takes you up another steep ladder, and then you're walking along the side of the mountain with just a chain that you're holding on to and really pulling yourself up because it is such a steep incline, and there's a bit of a guardrail keeping you from falling off of the mountain. So we saw a few people kind of freaking out at this last step and the ranger was really having to be a cheerleader to get them up this. Um, so like I said, if you have problems with heights, not a good idea to probably do this tour, but we loved it. Girls, tell me, what'd you think? Was it awesome? Yeah, yeah I burned my hand off. On the first long ladder, I burned my hand off. The tunnel was nothing. I was like, this the whole time. Yeah, uh, the ladder Look at me. Yeah, the ladder was scary. Which ladder? All of them? Yeah! It's just like, it's the ladder. Awesome. Super cool. Once I climbed the first one, I'm like, nah, the rest aren't going to be as long, but I'm fine. Like, how would you like to live down there? No thanks. What if it was your best way to stay safe? That would be too hot. So as you can see, overall, lots of smiles and lots of enjoyment from the Balcony House tour. Our next tour was then the Cliff Palace tour. The Cliff Palace tour begins at a spot that's near the parking lot. It's under the shade, which is nice. There's a bit of discussion about the tour and things to know. And then you go down a staircase and you kind of have to walk along some of the path and areas like that. So there is a bit of stairs and ladders and things like that. Again, you have to be pretty mobile to do this, but it's not nearly as treacherous and dangerous as the balcony house stuff. So definitely the kind of thing that smaller kids could do. Um, I think if you had some knee issues and stuff, it might be difficult to do, but uh, families, this is a very family friendly tour for you to do. And so as you come through, you come to a shaded area under part of the rock, and then the ranger gives a longer presentation about the cliff dwelling and information that's useful to see. Oh, and I forgot there's one early ladder and then there's more ladders as you're leaving the park and heading out of the um, Cliff Palace area. It's always a feat, and I'm always amazed that we could fit 55 people in this little section. Yeah. But as part, part of our choreography is human Tetris. Uh, <laughs> um, with that said, your holidays, planning a trip, I realized the logistics that go into traveling, flying. Families to support the military at this time from what the government has done to you. But yet, when you look at the statistics, Native Americans as a race have the largest per capita of people serving in the military. And when I tell people that, they're a little astonished. And it's because when we have roots that go back 40, 50,000 years to this continent, we're always gonna defend and protect this land. It doesn't matter who is, who is new within a past few hundred years. We had such an amazing ranger who gave the talk for our tour. And because he was native, he, he kind of had ancestral roots with this area. He offered a perspective that it was unlike anything I had heard in my history textbooks or learned about Mesa Verde even coming here as a kid 30 years ago. So it really was eye-opening and amazing to hear from this perspective and to be able to be in this area that's a very sacred space and have a greater appreciation for that. The tours are spaced out, so they're about an hour apart. So you have 55 people kind of in your group for one tour and you can see the next group, but you do have a bit of time just in your individual group to just be right there in the dwellings and kind of see everything up close and personal, which is really nice to get that close, but just understanding that you're not really going to be doing this alone and it's a quite a big tour group that you have that's going along with you. The Balcony House tour was a lot smaller just because of sheer size of the dwelling that you have there. The Cliff Palace is the largest dwelling that they have at Mesa Verde, and it's also probably the most famous and most photographed, so it's one of the more popular areas to see. The ranger wasn't 
presenting the whole time. There was a number of times where you could just kind of walk around and go on your own and talk to the ranger if you had questions and he had a bunch of resources with him and different handouts. Or you could just go and enjoy pictures and kind of take in all of the surroundings. And as our tour was finishing up and before we headed on the ladder back up, this is where I got my best shot, where we didn't really have anybody behind us because the next tour hadn't moved into this area yet. Then you move and go up some steps that are there and then take another ladder, a little bit of tight spaces again, not as bad as balcony house though, so definitely not as difficult to do. And you're back up at the end and the tour is over. From here, we headed over to the archeology span museum and there's tons of different dioramas set up and exhibits and there's some hands-on stuff, tons of information. If you care about the educational component for your kids, I highly recommend stopping here. A lot of cool stuff to keep their attention and just a lot of amazing information. We stopped at the cafe and had a little bit of Navajo fry bread and then the girls completed their swearing in for their junior ranger badges. And before we left the area, we got to hear from a ranger who makes his own hand flutes, and he was playing it. We then headed back to our campsite, and in terms of camping, we stayed in Cortez at the KOA. Within Mesa Verde, they just have the one campground and it doesn't have hookups. So this KOA gave us full hookups, a place that we could leave the dog for the day. We didn't have to worry about her because she, the, the Mesa Verde is not dog friendly at all. And you cannot leave them in the car. It's way too hot. Um, so this was a good option for us. And it also gave us good access to Canyon of the Ancients. And we'll have a whole nother video on just Canyon of the Ancients and why you should go there. And then Hoven Weep. And we'll have a video on that as well. So I hope this was a useful video for you in your planning for Mesa Verde. Please feel free to ask any comments um, or questions. You can tell us about what you love on Mesa Verde or ask any questions and we'll answer them. Also give it a thumbs up if you've stuck around this long. I'd really appreciate it. You can follow us at RV Homeschool on Instagram and Facebook. We have lots of other information about national parks, traveling with your kids, and RV travel in general. Thanks so much for watching.